welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. A super congratulations to the class of 2025. Y'all did it. Uh, my name is Samara Berger. I am with the Office of Enrollment Management and I am so excited to welcome you today to our Trailblazer session, Central Asia and the Problematic Lore of the Silk Roads, Challenging Knowledge Structures About the Past with Dr. Fiona Kidd of NYU Abu Dhabi. So our hope today is that you will get a glimpse into our vibrant academic community. You'll see for yourself why this place has become home for so many folks. So we hope that you leave the session today feeling inspired, feeling like you have access to some really talented faculty and you're excited by the possibility of joining our rich diverse community of thinkers, scholars, change makers, go-getters, fill in that blank for yourself. So before we go any further, I do just wanna share a couple of housekeeping items. Please note that you will be muted throughout the duration of the session. And while we can't see you, we do feel your energy out there. So stick with us, we promise a good show today. Uh, we will not cover any admissions or financial aid info, but if you do have questions about the next steps of your process, please visit our website, give us a call, send us an email. Our staff is ready and available to help any of those questions and concerns navigated. And if you're interested in asking questions specifically about this session, you can use that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We have a couple staff members answering questions behind the scenes, and we will have time for live Q&A at the end of the session. So let's get started. I would like to introduce Dr. Fiona Kidd. Dr. Kidd is an assistant professor of history and art and art history at NYU Abu Dhabi. She teaches in the history, art and art history and ancient world programs with a special focus on Central Asia. She has been involved in archeological museum-based and archival research in Central Asia for almost 20 years. After gaining her PhD in 2005 at the University of Sydney, she concentrated on field work in the historical region known as Khorzem in the Northwestern Uzbekistan. And in particular on a unrivaled first century CE corpus of mural paintings, the earliest such corpus in Central Asia. In 2015, following projects in Afghanistan and Kazakhstan, and time spent as an assistant curator in the Department of Ancient Near Eastern Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, she began a new collaborative field project in the Bukhara oasis of Sogdiana, Uzbekistan. Under the umbrellas of archaeology and art history, agro-pastoral relations, identity, and craft production have been consistent themes across these interdisciplinary projects. So in this webinar, we're going to think through how we learn about the past and why we need to challenge the frameworks we use to think about the world in which we live. Traditional Euro-American views of the past have been written from a perspective of sedentary urban agrarian empires or states. Think Rome and China, for example. These narratives have tended to omit many voices, the non-elite and the marginalized, as well as those often mobile populations living beyond the borders of such polities. One of the ramifications of these traditional perspectives is that when we learn about the past and also the present, Millions of people are left out, ignored, and forgotten. Increasingly, however, history and archaeology have demonstrated the critical roles in globalization cycles played by these peoples living in the intrinsic the intrins intricacies of empires <clears throat> and states. This inclusivity is vital. If we don't recognize the fundamental impacts of these people, then we miss out on the critical narratives about the past and how they shape the present. Using Central Asia as a case study, we're going to explore how two paradigms, the Silk Road and Asia area studies, have impacted how we approach the dynamic region today and how we understand connectivity. And we'll think about different sorts of questions to ask in order to challenge these paradigms and open up new, more diverse perspectives on the past. So with that, Dr. Kidd, take it away. Thank you so much and hello everyone out there. I'm pleased to be with you this, this evening in Abu Dhabi, morning, afternoon, wherever you are around the world. Um, I've been at NYU Abu Dhabi since 2014. As Samara mentioned, I teach in the history and the art, art history programs. Um, my undergraduate degree is in Near Eastern archeology span and my, um, my graduate degree is in, um, is in Central Asian archeology. span so, First of all, I think it's probably important to explain what an archaeologist does. I know when I was um, finishing high school, entering into university, I didn't really know what archaeology um, is all about. So I thought I'd begin there. What do we do? We, we excavate. We excavate and then we study the, um, the material culture, the stuff that we find. When we excavate, we dig, we survey, 
Um, we look at pottery, for example, things that we find. We look at, we go from the macro to the micro seeds. Archaeobotany is a really important part of, of the research that we do. We look, look at visual art. Um, here are some wall paintings that um, Samara was mentioning just before. Um, and of course, we are interested in landscapes. Um, and we'll hear a bit more about landscapes as we go on today. And what you're looking at here is some agricultural fields in the vicinity um, of the northern fringes of the Bukhara oasis. So we go from macro to micro scale, but ultimately what we do is collaborative. So I think of archaeology as a team sport. Um, the more specialists you have on your team, the more information um, that you're that you're that you're going to get out of the, the the finds that you make. So archaeology, in fact, has been very good to me. I've been incredibly lucky. It's taken me around the world, from Syria um, to to Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, um, Afghanistan. Um, and it's led me to actually question a lot of the, the lenses through which we view the past. And it's this that, that I want to, to talk about um, today. So there are a few questions that I've sort of, that I've been grappling with as I've wanted to try and understand um, the agro-pastoral, so the agricultural and pastoral um, animal economy of, of Central Asia. What shapes how we view the past? How is our knowledge framed? who and what impacts how we think about the past and how can we think critically about these knowledge structures um, in which we are entrenched. Um, so these, these questions have grown out of my, um, my archaeological research in, um, in Central Asia since, um, since 1999. So, I've been working mostly in, in Uzbekistan, um, and here you can see on this map the almost, I hope you can see these, these yellow lines, um, and this is um, just to orient you exactly where Central Asia is, and here's the, the, the global image. Um, so how is, how is knowledge structured? This is a question that I sort of started to think about um, already in my undergraduate de degree when I was studying um, Near Eastern archaeology. I always wanted to know what, what, what was further east, um, but I never really, we never really talked about connectivities um, further east. Um, but I mean, certainly I knew that, for example, um, the lapis lazuli, that here's a picture of the, of the, of the lapis, um, that decorated some of the amazing finds from the um, mid third millennium BC finds uh, royal graves at Ur, for example, you can see some of these, um, these finds here. I, I knew that that came from, from Badakhshan por, uh, province in, in Afghanistan and somehow it ended up over here in, in, in Iraq. Um, so I knew that there was some sort of a connectivity, um, but I wasn't really, I wasn't really sure um, of, of that connectivity um, and the, the significance of this connectivity certainly was never really expanded upon. Um, but it's these sorts of um, it's these sorts of um, questions, these sorts of problems that I that I think about a lot when I'm um, when I'm teaching my my Central Asian archaeology classes, for example. So these blockages, and I want students to understand um, how the research issues that they're dealing with um, and th that they're reading about have been um, have been developed. So, for example, in my class, um, Alexander and the Great in, in Central Asia, um, some of you may have heard of Alexander um, the Great. We use, we use the name as a hook um, to, to draw you in to Central Asia because so few people really know what Central Asia is. Um, but when I'm teaching Central Asia, um, I, I want my students to understand uh, that, that, that it is intrinsically connected. So this... Um, map that you're looking at here shows the route taken by um, by Alexander the Great from Macedonia over here in, in the Mediterranean all the way across to Central Asia um, and down into um, down into into um, into India. So this is an example of one of these sorts of, of, of one of these sorts of connectivities that were happening um, way before Alexander the Great came. Um, in the um, in the late in the uh, around 329 um, BCE into um, into Central Asia, so there are then this then makes me want to um, demonstrate to students um, a whole lot of a whole lot of points that they probably don't really think about very often. So, for example, 
Um, I want my students to know that there is evidence for long distance connectivity. Some people can, can refer to this as globalization. Um, in the third, already in the third millennium BC, if not, if not earlier, some people would push that back into the fourth millennium BC. I want my students to know that not all people lived in, in cities or in urban contexts or in agricultural empires. Um, and I want my students to know that mobile or se semi sedentary lifestyles are equally as important as sedentary lifestyles. And all of these points are really intrinsic to understanding um, Central Asia and, and the lifestyle that has, the agro-pastoral lifestyle that has sort of um, been the focus of this region uh, for millennia. These questions also um, bring us to a really important point about historiography. These questions are really, are really about historiography and historiography is the writing of history. It's about the study of history writing, um, especially as a, dis as a discipline. So how has history been written and whose texts are we reading? So how can, if we, if we sort of think about this, we can start to think about some of the truncated perspectives um, that we often, that we often um, um, read about when we're looking at, at the past and the, and the present. So there are two paradigms, two models that I want to talk through today. Um, in order to help us start thinking um, about the way history has been written about, the way, the way the past has been written about in Central Asia, area studies and Silk Road studies. And I'll explain um, what these are obviously as we go through. Um, but ultimately, uh, if, we want to be, um, if we want to be more inclusive, if we want to be aware of and challenge, challenge these um, uh, challenge knowledge structures, then this is historiography is a great way to start doing this. Thinking about who, who has written um, the histories that we're, that we're reading about. Before we get to that though, um, I have a question for you. And this is a, an audience question and you'll be able to answer this question. Who has studied Central Asia at school? You might've heard about it, but who has actually studied Central Asia at school? And while you're waiting and after you've answered, you can have a look at these lovely photos from, um, from Central Asia. Um, this is actually in the, um, the historical region of Khorasan um, in modern Karakal, Pakistan, which is um, where I have um, been working for, for quite some time. Okay, oh, so I saw the results come up um, and they disappeared quickly, but I think there they are. Okay, so, 67% have studied Central Asia a little bit, 11% uh, um, have, studied, have studied it, and 25% have not. So there's a, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people out there um, who really have not had much of a, of a look at Central Asia. And this sort of very much speaks to the point that I'm, that I'm making here and further points that I will make um, as, we, um, as we continue. So, it makes sense then to start um, and understand where is Central Asia. Um, so as you may know, um, Central Asia um, comprises a lot of the stands of the um, um, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan. It also incorporates parts of uh, Western China over here and parts of Southern Siberia as well. Um, so it's really, it's, a, it's actually a, um, a huge area. What you're looking at though right now are the modern political um, uh, borders. As archeologists, as, as I've mentioned before, of course, we're also very interested in landscapes. And if I take away the borders and you can see um, the landscape features, you, you might begin to see the landscape in a different way. So um, you can see a lot of diversity rivers, mountains, oases, uh, steppe, uh, the Aral Sea and Inland Sea. And this diversity, this, this um, uh, ecological diversity, landscape diversity is really, really important when we think about an agro-pastoral um, lifestyle. And it's really important when we think about the diversity of products that come from these different, um, these different ecological uh, niches. And this is really um, intrinsic to understanding uh, Central Asia and Central Asian lifeways. Um, so it's also really important to um, recognize that Central Asia 
was was never able to support a large agrarian empire. Um, and this is also, as we will see, this is one of the reasons why it, it hasn't been studied that much. It was never, there were never these large um, urban, um, urban centers where there was a history of, of um, a, a practice of history writing, for example, um, millennia ago. And this is a really important reason why uh, you may not know so much um, about Central Asia. And it's also a reason why Central Asia was never really incorporated into the major histories that you may have studied or that you, that you may go on to study um, at university. Um, so what I'm also getting at then is that these um, agro-pastoral populations, often um, mobile or semi-mobile, are rarely incorporated into the, the standard narratives of history that we, um, that we spend so much time um, thinking about. The other point that I will um, make, which speaks to the question that I just asked, you know, if, if we're talking about Central Asia and if it's so central, then how is it that we don't really know so much about it? And this is why I've put this, um, this picture on, on here. You can see, so Asia stretches from, from China all across to the Mediterranean. Um, so Central Asia really is quite, um, it really is quite central. Um, but again, because of the way history um, has been written and um, the way we traditionally study history, we tend not we tend not to hear so much about Central Asia. So then, let's um, so th this 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 cent this problem of centrality then really um, sort of plays into um, into one of the re into these reasons why I want to look at these two paradigms of area studies and Central Asia, so we can better understand how and why it is that we don't know so much about Central Asia. So let's start off with, um, with, uh, with area studies. So um, as you probably know, trends in academia are often linked with, uh, with geopolitics. So focused on nation states whose politics have, um, have relevance to the United States, area studies ended at a period of growth in the 1950s um, along with the Cold War and profoundly impacted the historiography of Central Asia. Academic disciplines often focused on those areas that were relevant to political interests, in this case of the United States. So in, in many ways, geographical location has been both a strength and a weakness of Central Asia. So what you can see then on this, on this map, in fact, is that Central Asia um, and all of the countries and the regions, Xinjiang in Western China, um, lies at the, the center of four of the four powerhouses of area studies. Russia, China, India, and Iran. Um, and it's these, 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 um, these, these um, regions that were the focus. Um, so never, never Central Asia um, itself. And this is, uh, this is really, really um, important. And it sort of starts to explain um, why it is that Central Asia um, was sort of neglected by a lot of um, a lot of um, university um, programs and academic um, and academic disciplines. So um, there's th th this um, the fact that Central Asia has sort of been left out of a lot of these historical na um, um, narratives also has rendered it in in a way an unsettled um, region, and there's a tension there. Uh, with Central Asia. Um, and one of the, um, one example of this tension, for example, um, is the, the, the border between Russia and China. And I've drawn it in a very schematic um, and unprofessional way here, but I really want to draw, draw your attention to this cleavage between Central Asia, uh, uh, between Russia and China, because it has a massive impact on the way that we view the, 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 um, the region. So um, Russian speaking specialists of Central Asia rarely have knowledge of, of, um, the, of Chinese language literature and what's going on in China and vice versa. Those working in China and who are able to read the Chinese language literature often can't access the, the Russian language literature. And this means that we, it's really difficult to view um, the, the whole Central Asia as an entire region. We, we look at it between um, the, the former Soviet Union and, and, and split between the former Soviet Union and China. Um, so this is really, this, this cleavage, this division has really imp um, impeded the development of integrated perspectives um, on the region as a whole. Um, 
There are other um, impacts of the way Central Asia is viewed. Um, and so that certainly the, the, um, the, the problems between, um, uh, that arise between geopolitics and academia are really important. As you can see, um, you know, um, mod, the boundaries of modern nation states are, are, are made, are drawn up to, um, uh, f f in, in, in regards to people and, and, and politics and not in regards to the landscape. And what's this, we see this problem here. So the, the Kizilkum Desert, um, in fact, is split in two between Kazakhstan and between Uzbekistan. Um, Uzbekistan and Afghanistan are, um, are divided here um, along the river, um, the Amudaria River. Um, and um, also we have oases that are divided. Um, you can see here, oases that are divided by national, na national boundaries as well. And this, this dividing up of, of landscapes is uh, very, um, very, very problematic, especially in a region um, that is characterized by mobile and semi-mobile um, populations. And so that it really impacts the, the, the life ways um, of these peoples. So one um, way that we can um, um, actually understand this in a more practical way is um, on these slides that I'm going to show you now. So what you're looking at is a Google Earth image of the Kizilkum. Um, so this, the, the arrows show exactly where we are. So we really are in the middle of the desert. Um, and if you have a look on Google Earth, what is actually really interesting is that there's a lot going on in the middle of this, of this desert. These are yellow place markers that I've put in place simply to indicate an anthropogenic site. I don't necessarily know what the site is, but I know that there's something there, something human made. When I say anthropogenic, I, made, um, I, may, I, may, I mean human made. Um, and it might be surprising for you that there are so many, um, that there's so much going on, so many sites um, in, the, in the desert. And what is really interesting and what the point that I wanna make is as you can see, these, these, um, these sites, whatever they are, they don't stop at the international borderline. They continue right through the borderline. And you can see this down here and up here um, as well. So, um, so these, these ecological, um, um, at ground level ecological um, features serve actually as a junction for a diversity of lifestyles facilita facilitating millennia old symbiotic relations between the populations of Asia. But these, these, um, these lifestyles have been um, cleaved by modern, um, the, board, the boundaries of modern nation states. Okay, so what I think then um, a lot of these sites are, and this is what you see when you see close up, um, these, these, circular, um, these circular structures, there's something going on up here. It may well be that they're animal corrals. And this is an example of what one of these animal corrals look like uh, on the ground. Okay, so then um, area study uh, area studies. Um, the the one of the impacts of area studies has been um, to render Central Asia a transitional area. It's passed over, but it's never never actually studied. So, what does what does uh, the Silk Road paradigm look like in the context of of, um, of Central Asia? So what you're looking at now is a map showing the main east-west routes of the so-called Silk Roads. And what you can see is that essentially these, um, these routes join China in the east uh, with the Mediterranean in the west. And here we've got Central Asia uh, in the middle. Okay, here's the Aral Sea that we were looking at before. And here is Xinjiang over here that we could see. So the, these routes joining, joining China and Rome as the traditional, um, the traditional language goes, but essentially borders these big agricultural empires. And it focuses on um, urban uh, centers um, across these routes. And in many ways, um, it leaves out, of course, again, um, the, uh, the, 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 the mobile populations who were in fact affecting many of the exchanges. So the traditional narrative goes that, you've, that there's one route and you've got you know, people traveling very, very long distances um, for, for purposes, merchants for purposes of exchange um, to, to populate these, these routes. And the way that these histories have been written have always been written from the perspective of the urban 
um, literate societies. And again, this is not necessarily the, 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 the mobile and the semi-mobile and the non-elite people who are, who are on, the on the ground um, um, making so many of these, uh, making so many of these connections. Um, this is also problematic for us because um, if we want to think about connectivity um, and uh, and globalizations, then what we're what we're really looking at with the, these Silk Roads are ex Eurasian exchange routes. The Silk Road again, it, it's this idea of silk and the exchange of silk pertains to the luxuries of these urban. Um, urban empires, which again sort of miss the point of what's going on um, at the at the centre of these of these routes um, and what's being um, perpetrated by the the mobile and the semi mobile um, populations. So um, what what these Silk Roads also do is they focus on an east west connection and they forget about the north south um, connections and uh, and other um, and other connections. So in fact, these Silk Roads again they sort of um, they sort of serve to, to, to take the focus away from Central Asia. So um, this situation started to turn, um, especially um, in the 1990s with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the opening up of, of Eastern Europe and the form, former Soviet Union. And then in the year 2000, there was a, for me, very inspirational paper written by David Christian, Silk Roads or Step Roads, the Silk Roads in, um, in world history. Um, and this sort of um, his his discussion, David Christian's discussion, facilitated renewed interest in the importance of landscapes and ecology as catalysts for interaction. Um, so there was then th this sort of this sort of this global turn resulted in this this opening up and this blossoming of of literature. And here you've, I've got just some of the the, the books that have come out um, since the, the year two thousand dealing with the Silk Road, and you can see that they deal with a whole lot of different aspects. Of the um, of the Silk Road, um, so David Christian actually sort of then changed the the the, the discussion. Rather than going between urban and agrarian um, empires, um, which he termed a uh, trans civilizational exchange, he um, sort of coined the term trans ecological exchange. And why this is really important is because. Um, as you can see on this map, the Silk Roads, or these, these Eurasian exchange routes, as we should properly call, pro, uh, properly call them, in fact, run along the borders of these ecological niches. So here you've got um, Desert Steppe, and here um, along the Tian Shan, you've got a mountainous region. And um, with trans-ecological exchange, um, we, David Christian was saying um, that, that this is where this, the, the, the meeting point of these um, different ecological niches is where you have the richest um, uh, platforms of exchange. Um, mobile populations and merchants then were vital weavers of connectivity, spatially and temporarily and temporarily um, across land and sea, moving um, not just themselves and their goods, but technologies, languages, knowledge, skills, iconographies, images, and ideas. And this was critical. This, this is a really um, critical point to recognize if we want to bring in different populations and different perspectives onto this trans ecological um, um, exchange question. So then what the, the problematic lure that, um, of the silk roots that I refer to in my title is the privileging of textual sources written by sedentary urban agricultural empires. Um, it's the privileging of centers um, over peripheries. So urban centers over rural and nomad peripheries. It's a focus on east-west movement <clears throat> rather than north-south movement. Um, and we, we, in all of these, these points, we have to say, well, where, where are the agropastoral and the pastoral populations that have defined Central Asia for, um, for millennia? So if we want to challenge these paradigms, the, the, the Silk Roads um, paradigm and the area studies paradigm, we need to start asking new questions. We need to think about connectivity in terms of um, east, west and north, south. We need to recognize the importance of landscape. We need to think about mobility. What does mobility mean? Seasonal, what long distance, short distance. We need to think about local and global or macro and micro scales of, of analysis, always relating the two to each other. And we also need to think about 
<clears throat> changing our terminology. So instead of saying center and periphery, which brings about this baggage of the urban center and the, the rural or the, the, the mobile periphery, we can um, think about um, nodes and hubs, for example, and we can think about um, networks of exchange, for example. So changing the, the terminology that we use seems really simple, um, but it's a good way to get us start uh, to get us to start thinking more um, more critically and more constructively. So um, ultimately, then, if we want to aim for an in an inclusive approach to the past, um, we need to challenge these. We need to be aware of, and we need to challenge these pa these these paradigms. Um, so we've um, we've looked at some of these paradigms that the, the, all these lenses through which we see the past area studies and silk roads, um, and we can think about new ways of approaching connectivity, um, looking at landscape perspectives, thinking about ecological um, niches and what these give to us. Um, and in terms of a way forward, we need to to think more inclusively. So who and what is not included in the traditional or standard narratives? Thank you. That was so amazing, Dr. Kidd. Thank you so much. Um, I truly like what a taste of being in the classroom with you and getting a sense of your research and your experience. Uh, for our audience, we would love to take some of your questions. So go ahead and drop those in the Q&A box uh, and we will, we will pitch them to Dr. Kidd. And while you're, you're thinking about all of your amazing thoughts and the things that you wanna ask, um, I would love to kind of pitch one of your questions back to you, Dr. Kidd, about um, how can we as the, the lay person be helping to change the future of these relations when there is so much historical tension across borders? Yeah, I, I do think um, that one of the most basic things we can do is change the terminology that we use. Um, <clears throat> even something as simple as, as the Silk Roads, um, instead of saying Silk Roads, we can talk about exchange routes. Um, instead of saying centre, um, qualify what we mean by centre. Um, is it, a, is it a, a node or a hub? A hub is probably um, a good word. Um, so I think um, qualifying these, so this sort of terminology um, that, we, that we use, you know, we, we, if we, if we, th there's a lot of problematic terms that we use. What, what's urban? Urban is defined in all different sorts of ways. We, we, refer, we refer to ancient civilization. Um, that, of course, in itself brings up a whole lot of problem, problems. What's civilized and what's uncivilized, for example. We sort of, we tend to forget a lot about the baggage that, um, of the, of the, that the terminology brings with it. And, but this is, this is terminology that's in, in everyday usage. And this is why we don't think about it. And this is why it's really important to think about um, the way we the way we structure our arguments, there are all sorts of implications, un, un, unwritten, un, unspoken implications um, in the terminology that we use. And I think we would do well to think much more carefully about how we use words. That's such an important point, and I think you know crosses beyond this this topic and and things that we need to think about as humans in general and the way that we use words and terminology and the effect that they can have. Um, and those historical roots that can, be, that can be impacted. Um, yeah. So I have a I have another question for you, question for you. Uh, many of the areas that you were covering in the Central Asia region are still quite newly developed, right? Like I know Kazakhstan still has so much land that has is not currently developed, and is that partially a because of archaeological sites, or is it really just a lack of resources and access based on some of that historical tension? Um, a lot of the, the land isn't, is, is probably not very um, habitable. If we think about Desert Steppe, um, for, for example, um, <clears throat> it's really, um, well, how we inhabit the land um, is, 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 a, is, a, is a good question. Um, why is it not, populations are sparse in, in Central Asia as well. Um, I mean, certainly um, landscape dynamics are changing. Um, there's railway lines being built, for example, in, in Uzbekistan, certainly. Um, um, Astana, the capital of, of, of Kazakhstan, is, is, a, new, is a, new, a newly built capital. Um, so certainly landscapes are, are changing, um, but the, the population is, is sparse uh, anyway. So there's not um, necessarily gonna be a whole lot of 
um, a whole lot of development across these these areas anyway. That makes tons of sense. Um, okay, to pivot a little bit, I have a question um, from somebody in our audience who would like to know specifically how can archaeology and the study of archaeology help to change some of these historical perspectives and kind of get us on that path of using proper terminology, better understanding cultures from then and to today? Yeah, that's a, I think that's a great question. Um, well, but, but I mean, if archeologists um, and, and practitioners past, people who are studying the past are sort of brought into, um, into conversations more often, um, and just again, in the, way that, in the way that we speak, the terminology that we use, um, part of the problem with archeology span um, is that, you know, often what we do is, well, it's, sometimes it's very, very large scale. Sometimes it's very, very small scale. But it's a real skill to be able to make your um, highly academic research available um, to, to a general audience. Um, but I think this is really, really important. Um, being able to if being able to share your your research in in layperson's um, terminology, uh, I think um, can definitely start to help um, people um, understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, but as I was saying, you know, starting to starting to, to change the change the narrative, um, and the narrative is changing. It's definitely changing. Um, but we need to we need to change change this narrative more so that people understand um, what we're doing and why we're doing it, um, and what the impacts of our of our work are. Um, and so, you know, taking a more inclusive approach, for example. Um, writing people back into in, into history, into the past, giving these the, the so-called voiceless people um, a, a role um, in the past, um, and making that that prominent today is is one way that we can um, really start to see the past in a more inclusive way. Absolutely, I think that piece on in inclusivity truly is the key, right, and, and the key to so many so many of our struggles lately. Um, so I feel like this, this question from one of our attendees kind of flows really nicely into your response. Do you think that 20, the 21st century is Asian specific and, and a focus where we have to have as a society, unlike the 20th century that was more focused on Western American society? Um, I would say, what about Africa? I would, what, I would say, what about Southern America? Um, um, you know, I, I don't know that um, we should be thinking in those, ter those terms because really, I mean, ultimately we are very, very connected. Um, you know, the, the modern incarnation of these, of these Eurasian exchange routes is the Belt, is the belt and Road, for example. Um, and that goes into, that goes well and truly into Africa, of course. So um, I, don't, I don't really, I don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying that we're, that we're moving into an Asian century. Um, I would hope that we're moving into a, a much more um, into a much more, glo a more, more globally aware um, century um, and a much more globally conscious and um, kinder century really that is that um, really takes into account what is going on in all different countries and you know I say that with full awareness of what's going on today for example in India um, um, which is, is part of Asia, of course, if you want to take the full extent of the, um, of the term. So yeah, I would hope that we're moving into um, a much a, a global awareness um, rather than um, a, a continent specific awareness. Absolutely. And I think so important about be, uh, just a kinder future, but moving into a kinder space where they're like, we're, we're able to learn from each other rather than be so afraid of each other. Um, and yeah. so I have another great question here that I think lends itself to that. Um, what do you think are the, is the future of this region? How can some of our, you know, newly admitted NYU students who are here to have that global experience, what can they expect? How could they maybe contribute? Which region? Which region in Central Asia? I'm sorry, the Central oh, Asia. In Central, well, I mean, certainly um, there's a lot of a lot of students from Central Asia that come to NYU AD, which is is fabulous. Um, and I mean, I really hope that these students will, um, after they've 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 got their degree across the GNU, wherever, where whichever portal that they 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 um, they're stationed at. Um, I hope that at some stage they will go back to Central Asia um, and, um, and 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 help to help to 
um, develop the region in the way that it needs to be developed, um, wh whatever that whatever that may be. Um, there are a lot of areas um, where um, developing nations um, need assistance. Um, and so I would hope that, I mean, I would also hope that as we become more, become more globally aware, more people are, are able to lend their assistance, lend their, lend, lend their, their, their expertise um, to, to this region and any other um, developing region as well. Um, but I have to say, it's, I'm very, very heartened by the fact that, um, that we have so many central, students from Central Asia um, at NYUAD. I think it's, um, I think it's hugely, hugely positive. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, it is it truly is the beauty of NYU that you get this global perspective and, and an opportunity, unlike many universities where you where you really can be immersed in what you're studying in the area that you're studying in, um, is really is unmatched. And I think that, um, you know, it's it's truly a privilege for our students to be able to start to access absolutely. That so young. Absolutely. Um, yeah. All right. I have two more quick questions. This one from our audience is a little bit specific. So um, if you can't answer it, it's okay. We'll, we'll give you, we'll point you in some direction to maybe find some response. But this, this person would love to hear your thoughts on the Mongols as an example of a mobile people whose empire is being forced uh, into a historical reckoning with nomadic perspectives. Being forced into a historical reckoning with nomadic perspectives. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I, this is definitely not my specialization, but the, the Mongols are actually, um, quite interesting um, and maybe speak speak to my point a bit because the, the Mongols also had these, um, what we could call, um, what have been called um, urban centers, step urban centers. Um, so again, um, if we want to use the word nomad and nomad is another word that I would, um, that I would challenge because what is nomadic? There are really very, very few people who are truly, truly um, nomadic. Um, but um, the Mongol Empire, um, uh, in terms of their in, in terms of their their, their, their their infrastructure and their political centres, um, probably need to be. We might want to think about them a bit more broadly um, um, and a bit beyond just a simple nomadic uh, empire. Is is the is what I would say at this stage, bearing in mind that this is definitely not my specialisation. <laughs> A great example, though, of how maybe we need to shift some of our perspectives as we're learning and, yep. and ensure that we're we are being more inclusive about those experiences of, yep. of those specific peoples. So yep. last question, I think this is a great one to wrap up on. Do you have any advice for any of our students who are thinking about pursuing archaeology or art and art history? Um, anything you'd like to leave this class of 2025 with? Um, be bold. Be very, very bold in your subject choices and be interdisciplinary. Um, um, archaeology is intrinsically interdisciplinary. Archaeology is probably um, the poster child of interdisciplinarity from a humanities perspective because we really do cross into the sciences um, in a very um, in a very active way. Um, but yeah, my advice for the for the incoming class is to be bold in your subject choices. Try something new, especially in your first year when you can do something that you would never ever have thought about doing, just to challenge yourself um, and to to open doors um, and be as as broad as I know. Eventually, you have to specialize, but be as broad as you possibly can because you do not know where your life is going to take you. Yes, that is such great advice. That is such great advice to leave everybody with. So again, huge, huge thank you to Dr. Kidd. This was a wonderful session. I feel like I could chat all day and ask you tons of questions, um, but it was such a pleasure. And thank you to our audience for being here, for um, you know sticking through with us and, and asking some great questions. Before we wrap up, I do just want to share a couple of ways you can continue, continue to stay connected with us throughout the coming months. So if you have any questions about the next steps of your admission, you can feel free to email us at admissions at nyu.edu. If you have questions specifically about NYU Abu Dhabi, you can of course reach out to nyuad.admissions at nyu.edu. And lastly, if you have uh, questions specifically about NYU Shanghai, you can reach out at shanghai.admissions at nyu.edu. Of course, follow us on all the social channels at Meet NYU. We are always posting new content, new stories, days in the life of our current students. Um, and until we can officially welcome you to your campus in the fall, be sure to check out our other virtual offerings uh, and con congratulations again. It was, it, we can't wait to welcome you 
Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye.